I'll give you the bio that I have. And it is this. Leo! Pamela Sneed is a Boston-born, New York-based poet, actress, activist, and teacher. She is the author of two collections of poetry, Imagine Being More Afraid of Freedom Than Slavery and Kong, and other works. Please welcome Pamela to the stage. women like trophies. Assorted shapes, sizes, colors, contours. Each affirmed her ability to make even modest women want to climb inside her skin like soldiers seeking refuge from the storm. She never stayed long enough to love. Only enough to ignite their attention, but when they began to clear their closet, she talked of traveling and needing a larger space. I knew I never should have gotten involved with that woman. I knew! I never should have gotten involved with that woman. Part of her power being, she was a bad butch who made women unravel. Come undone at the seams like Wonder Woman beneath her armor was desperate. I knew! I never should have gotten involved with that woman, but somewhere inside she moved me! To another country. Oh. <laughs> And I started speaking in languages I never learned. Wow. <laughs> you know, it's a poem I wrote a while ago. Nice. The only thing that could have made Madonna's halftime show any better. <laughs> is if she had added one more smoke machine. <laughs> and all the angels of black queens could have appeared. Willie Ninja, House of LaBeja, Pendavis, Dorian Corey, Extravaganza, Chanel, and all those peer queens dead now, whose names like the slaves descended off the shores of Cape Coast or Gory Island, we'll never know. They could have shouted over Nicki Minaj and M.I.A. in a language that they invented, narrating as Madonna strutted and strolled, work, Miss Thang, and served the children, adding in the C word as exclamation. And at the end of her gorgeous Super Bowl song, Like a Prayer, she could have bowed, looked up, and said, thank you, in a voice no one except her needed to hear. Oh, yes. of Britney's last tour album was called Circus. And she's got it right because that's what it is. Today, today, they went after Michael Jackson's doctor, wanted someone to blame like someone in a child's game, sick with fear, fever frenzy, needing someone to pin it on. We all know how he died and why. It's obvious we all had stakes in it. He was the village wish, warlock, even had the audacity in broad daylight to change forms. <laughs> <laughs> he played the part well, with fit spells, ill judgments like that crazy bitch, Hecuba. He became the symbol of all of our fears, the person with whom we felt safe and superior enough to pin it on. I saw the cover of the New York Post a few days ago, and all it said for that brave brown boy of supernatural talent, all for the boy whose organs were feasted and fed upon, all it said for that king of American music was dead. And our black president remained strangely silent. Today they went after Michael Jackson's doctor like they went after the doctor of Anna Nicole and her lover Howard Stern. Didn't want to say that that tall Texan beauty died long ago. And what was left went with Daniel, her son. She was a train wreck. We couldn't stop watching over and over some new shock and thriller we couldn't get enough of. And this is dark. I wanted to be as bright and shiny as Michael when he sang, we are the world. But they went after his doctor like they went after Mary Kate Olsen after Heath Ledger's death. The audacity was how everyone in Hollywood, the tabloids, covered up Ledger's death, called it a tragic yes. accident. Only Deepak Chopra had the courage to say what was felt all along. It was no accident. It was despair. A growing despair. And soon the papers will begin to proclaim what we're all going to feel, dead. 
mindless, numb, a surface existence moving from one shopping center and competitive sport to another, while the only green allowed to prosper and thrive will be envy. Uh. I thought there would be no more reason to write these kind of poems. Not since the 80s before we discovered in this decade lesbians really do like men. But today the papers and news report the story of a seven-year-old in Trenton, New Jersey, gang raped by a group of men. And then I run into a former student from the old days at the Gay and Lesbian Community Center. She and I talked about a former student I can't remember, said she was a lesbian who went to a party, was gang raped and thrown off of a roof and killed. Her girlfriend, whom we both knew, whom I taught poetry to, to was never the same, she said. And the accounts keep pouring in, a young woman in a Manhattan bar followed into a bathroom stall, beaten senselessly, eye removed from the socket after she rejected a man. The young man who sliced his girlfriend ear to ear after she broke up with him. The taxi cab driver who stalked and eventually dismembered a former beauty queen. And no one even talks anymore about those little girls from Juarez, Mexico, disappeared, then murdered. Put together, it seems like there was a little or lots more to those feminists who used to hang out on the main street drags, holding up pornographic pictures of mutilated women and girls, women that Playboy magazine used to put in meat grinders. Yeah, there was a lot more to those feminists with the bad outfits and bowl haircuts, looking like they hadn't been intimate in a long time. Women holding up images you couldn't look past, but tried to. Mm. feeling this as I go along, but let's, let's, uh... Never thought it would have ended this way. Mm. Or begun. Fifteen years later, survivors sitting in Popeye's Chicken, downtown Brooklyn, our coleslaw and mashed potato cups imprinted with, we love chicken. Us uh, sitting quietly for hours, staring into the afternoon out of Popeye's big glass windows. When we first sat down, Colin smoothed his napkin over his lap. I was impressed at how elegant he was for Popeye's, our gold and silver rings glistening as we ate chicken, brought it to our lips. We, I think, were unlikely customers, but who would have thought decades later we would be sitting together in Popeye's? The sole survivors of a generation gone. Our brothers and sisters gone from AIDS and cancer. We came together accidentally through a show that later funding fell through. We determined bravely without question as we always had both separately and together to go on. That part of the legacy Donald Woods and Essex Hemphill, Audrey oh. Lord, Asato Saint, Pat Parker, Marlon Riggs yes. had left us with was to find, to never walk away without finding, through whatever circumstance to keep going. We had at least Colin and I the memory of Asato slamming his hand on the pulpit at Donald's funeral. <coughs> we know somewhere inside we must always tell the truth. Colin and I are the witnesses, our tribe's council. We buried each of those men we saw. And over the years, we haven't spoken much, not even on this project, but today during a rehearsal, during the recitation of a poem, he grabbed my hand, full of trust and innocence, held on, then let go. And for me, even as a poet, that moment meant more than words. Yes. Yes! Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. I'm going to do, uh, I'm gonna do the, the piece that made me famous, all right? Oh, yes! We're going back. <laughs> Woo! The saddest thing in the world has got to be when you love someone, unable to provide the love and support you need, and staying with them would be a form of suicide. It took all I had to leave her emotionally. She still has a part of me. A year of therapy to resolve something an honest conversation might have solved, and now I'm stuck with everything I didn't say, and she's not here to say it to. I tried to pretend it didn't hurt as much as it did, searched all over this earth for a safe place, and I can't walk up to somebody and ask them to give me back to myself. 
I just keep searching inside, hoping to find an answer. Mimi! She's my mother. Mimi! She's my father. Maybe she embodies all the insecurity I ever felt, and that's why I keep coming back here over and over. I ask myself, is it love? But it isn't desire that drives me back to her. It's the fact she has a piece of me I want. The pain to end, to belong to myself, and freedom to love someone who loves me back the way I need them to. I don't want any more illusions. No more women who appear powerful but underneath have the emotional life of a two-year-old. <laughs> I'm keeping the same standard for myself. I am aware and responsible for my life, and it's hard to believe that. I want to give my power to anyone, anything passing by, because I'm terrified to own myself. If we owned ourselves, we could overturn this earth. There would be no reason to destroy everything we are, but it's easier and safer to stay small. In Nicaragua, one man owned an entire peninsula, and all of the food peasants picked belonged to him, which they had to after aching and sore muscles by back. When the Sandinistas revolted, some of the peasants were given their own land and machinery, but seven years later, the machines were still sitting there unoperated because the people hadn't been taught to take care of themselves. Wow. And in the 1800s, after that long war, some of the slaves went back to the plantation. Imagine. Being more afraid of freedom than slavery. Wow. Constantly sabotaging and squeezing into places too small for your potential. And even though you know this, you can't stop because slavery is all you know. Wow. They ask why. Why? Don't women leave lovers who abuse them? There's no land where we are free. I was not taught to honor myself. I'm painting a simple portrait. There are factors I haven't mentioned, like lovers who say they'll kill us, declare us unfit for our children, no money, no place to go. In India, women are encouraged to abort girl children. My mother was beaten so badly, the doctor said that she would die, and she stayed. But I'm making a promise to myself, as this earth is my witness, mm. I'm going to be free. And I won't have to stand here yes. dragging these dead pieces of flesh, mm. searching for a scrap of something to cover myself, and maybe you never saw somebody fall to the floor and ask God for a way out of the wilderness. Maybe you never loved somebody so bad you stumbled out like a rag doll. Mm dragged across the coals. When Harriet met John Tubman, he was the most beautiful man. Something about his hands, his feet, a back unscarred by slavery. And she dreamt that they would settle somewhere, his arm across her shoulder, their lives firmly entwined. But slavery infiltrated every aspect of their lives. Sometimes it disguised itself, and other times it stood an obstruction to every effort. And Harriet tried to explain how Earth was an invitation. How she never saw the river, never touched the trees, the sun would dry out of her eyes and she would die. But John saw himself like a bird without wings. Aren't I enough, he'd ask. And even though she left him in the dry dust of a summer day, mm -hmm. she felt abandoned. those terrible poems about ex-lovers. <laughs> well, I wanted to write a different one and say I liked her. <laughs> because she was an insatiable fuck, willing anywhere, anytime. Because during, that big, because during that big blackout in New York that happened a few years back after 9-11, which all the newscasters called a tragedy and, sh and such, she and I used the city's all-day electrical outage as an opportunity to fuck like two buddies in the heat. We held an indoor picnic and went, and went to buy groceries and supplies, buy candlelight, then went swiftly back to our fucking. I liked her. <laughs> because one night while watching
watching TV, we rented the film, Lord of the Rings, Fellowship <laughs> of the Rings, the, the Two Towers, you know, one of those big Hollywood blockbuster action movies mixed with some warmongering and medieval shit. Well, anyway, I loved her because it was nearing the end of that movie where the handsome movie actor of swashbuckling variety is fighting his final battle. Oh, the chips are down. <laughs> Enemies everywhere, and it must look to, to uh, the outside eye like he and his team of good guys have surely lost the war. And one of his trusted counselors goes to him and tries to dissuade him from fighting by saying, "There is no hope." <laughs> And right when he puts on the armored suit and dashes into battle, he says, there is always hope. My lover, the woman I'm speaking of, turns to me and says, meaning him, you're him, right? I liked her. Because uh -huh. once when I had gone on a, a trip and come back, she said, I plan to meet you at the airport naked under a coat, but I feared being discovered. Homeland security is ruining our relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and once while going on another trip, she and I fucked so hard in the parking lot, I was late for the plane, and then when I entered the terminal, discovered I was at the wrong airport, and then my lover transports me in her car on top of her wings on back of her imaginary horse, and we're like the Lone Ranger and Tonto galloping down the highway full speed. I ended up making that flight. I liked her. Because once when we were standing on a soccer field on a Saturday afternoon, watching her eight-year-old daughter play soccer, the sun shone brightly on the field, then the team switched side and all of the action goes an opposite way, and she turns to me after we fought the evening before when she's only going to walk a few steps and says, come with me. I liked her, because she wanted us to study the Karma Sutra and for us to buy the cake. <laughs> and finally, I liked her the best because accidentally or occasionally while making love, when neither of us was guarded, she placed her slender brown hands around the back of my head, cradled it the way a mother does with a child, gazes lovingly into their eyes as a way of protecting them and keeping them.